Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to another Thursday Home Theater Hangout with me and Matt Pose from Pose Acoustics on YouTube. So if you're not subscribed to Matt, go over there, subscribe to Matt. But this is our third podcast about how to build a spare room into a home theater. We tackled room acoustics in the first episode. The second one was flooring and risers. Today, we're going to talk about building a false wall and Matt... I wanted to ask you, what's the difference between a false wall and a baffle wall? The baffle. So a false wall really just refers to some sort of framed area in the front of the room. And uh, it's not actually a wall. It'll look like it because you're going to cover it in fabric or something else uh, as well as a screen. And then behind that usually is a lot of acoustic treatment and speakers. A baffle wall it actually has a baffle, meaning it's a hard surface, drywall, plywood, something like that. And it fits tightly around the speakers. And so it extends the baffle of the speakers all the way out to the side walls, floor and ceiling. Baffle walls are technically better. They'll give you better performance, but they're less flexible. And the false wall approach is nice because you can put anything in there, but you don't eliminate SBIR and you actually get fairly substantial 6 dB gain from a baffle wall that you can't get from a false wall installation. And so here I see you've posted a bunch of stuff. Yeah, so are we talking about baffle wall where the, uh, the front of the speaker is on the front of the wall? Yeah, it has to be tight right up against the baffle of the speaker yeah. so it can extend it. So it's like you can have a cutout for the speakers in the wall. Yeah, and technically an in-wall speaker in a wall, is a that's a baffle wall installation. So like I have in-wall speakers mounted in a, it's a partial wall, so it's effectively a baffle wall though. So pretty much what this uh, center channel is looking like here. Yeah, it's pretty close. I, the problem yeah. is I can't tell. It looks like it's a very loose material, so that may not actually be a real baffle wall. Um, mm. but assuming that's hard, like drywall or plywood or something, then yes, that would be a baffle wall. Well, let's go. Let's type in baffle wall. I typed in a false wall because that's what I'm doing. Here we go. That's a baffle wall. Yes. That is a classic baffle wall design right there. And what they've done by obvious, actually mine's there. <laughs> that's funny. Which one? Oh, um, there it is. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. You like the third option. There you go. I'm popular. Can I say? Uh, the other one that, that's there as well, which is the uh, Meyer Sound one, those are all classic designs for baffle walls. So, you know, there's acoustic material that's put around the speakers because there's sound that will radiate to the sides. But the other reason for it actually is that the sound hits the screen. And even though it's acoustically transparent, it's not perfect. So some of the sound will hit the back of the screen and then come back onto the baffle. And you get this uh, interference pattern that forms because of that uh, called comb filtering. And so the absorption material helps with that. The other thing is light. If you paint it black, that's actually not as black in terms of light reflectiveness as black fabric. So I used suede. Velvet is actually better yet, but foam yeah. works fine. The idea is just something that's got sort of a flocking like texture to it helps reduce the amount of light scatter. Was that what we were talking about yesterday? The uh, micro suede? My, yeah, you were talking about using micro suede and I was saying it's fine. It's not as black as velvet, but it's okay. Um, you won't. This doesn't reflect anywhere near enough light to be noticeable on a baffle wall. Right, right, right. Yeah, because I want to do that on my walls. But it looks a little shiny. Or is that just because you didn't brush it or whatever to get the, the strokes out? It's not shiny. I don't know where you're getting that from. <laughs> it looks a little shiny there, dude. <laughs> All right. Go click on the one above it there, the QSIS. I said that that was Meyer Sound. That's actually uh, QSC's cinema system. Uh, let me go back to that. So one. Right above mine. Oh, now, this one here? To the left. Yeah, there you go. Okay. That, yeah, that's like a really classic design because they've actually used the material we all used to use until it got crazy expensive called line acoustics. So standard baffle wall. And then instead of using foam or something like that, what they've done is actually adhered. It's duck liner with a black material on it. So you oh, can gotcha. see that's no shinier than mine. And it's used in <laughs> professional cinemas all the time. Um, that's a good material. If you can get it cheap, it's like one of the best things you can use. The problem is line acoustics has gotten crazy expensive. It's gotten much cheaper to use pretty much anything other than that. So, um, doing that, you get rid of the SBIR, which stands for a screen boundary, speaker boundary, interference speaker boundary, response. interference yeah. response. So that's when the speaker sits out. I mean, you always are going to have some of that from other walls in the room, but the most dominant speaker boundary interference response patterns we see are actually the distance between the front of the baffle of the speaker and the actual back wall, or front wall, I should say, of the room. And so sound radiates around, you know, and hits yeah. back there, and then it comes back again and interferes with itself. And um, if you place the speaker in the wall, there's no reflection then off the front wall anymore. Um, 
And when it extends to the sidewalls, floor and ceiling, it reduces some of that too, but not completely. So the remaining SBIR then becomes the sidewalls, the floor, the ceiling, and the back wall, but those are never as significant as the front wall one. So often if you're calibrating a system, for instance, and you see like there's a big null around 80 Hertz, it's very often related to that front wall. And so to, to, that's our crossover point. So to mitigate that, if you're just building a false wall, wouldn't you line the entire front wall with some kind of absorption, then you'd hang the speaker in front of it? Yeah, so you had those pictures up before people had done that. I mean, yes, here's the problem. You need like a foot of insulation. And then what often happens when people do this is that they cover so much of the front wall with insulation to address that issue that the front wall ends up being 100% of the absorption area that the room needs and the room becomes way too dead. So my recommendation right. is to be very judicious with that or to actually use absorption that's more base focused so you can limit the bandwidth of the absorbers by not just having it be raw insulation, but actually have it have a plate or a cover on it of some kind. Got you. Way, you still address a lot of these issues at low frequencies, but you've not over absorbed the room because really you want some absorption on the sidewalls, on the ceiling and on the back wall. Got you. Okay. Well, unfortunately, I will not be doing a baffle wall because since I'm going to be reviewing a lot of speakers, I'm going to have to do the false wall to make swapping speakers out easier. Yeah. So what is, uh, so your best option is to place not so much insulation on the front wall, like, like sporadically place it or Well, I think we would probably, yes, but I think we would probably cover it with membranes and stuff like that too. So you can do all sorts of different things to help with this. You can put pegboard over it. It's like it's in terms of cheap tricks, you can put pegboard over it and then put some black fabric over that. You can put um, membranes, like just even drop cloth plastic, uh, has been used before. So you want the highest mill you can get for not the really cheap stuff. That's like garbage can garbage bag thickness, but like something that's actually pretty nice. So a higher mill thickness of uh, drop cloth plastic, you put that over it, then you put some um, fabric. In fact, there's this, it's, it's relatively acoustically transparent, it's weed cloth. So not the kind that looks like woven, but it actually looks like it's made of these swirly fibers that have all been sort of pressed together and it's kind of papery. Um, and it's, it's used to keep weeds from growing up. That is a really cheap way to cover this. So we could look into that and see if they, I, I haven't used it in so long that I don't want to guarantee that the currently available stuff would work for this. But uh, the stuff you used to be able to buy, at least, was really good. Um, so we could go ahead and, and do something like that to reduce your amount of absorption area so that it's not so high, but still does right. the job we need it to. Right, right, right. And um, how would that affect, how's, how's placing your subwoofers behind a false wall? How does that interact? So you can anything? see how they've done it here. It's the same thing, whether it's a false wall or a, a baffle wall, you just place them where you need them. So in many of these scenarios, there's not room. So it depends on what you're doing. If you're doing waveforming, you're going to have to place the subwoofers at very specific locations. And they actually tend to match where the left and the right speakers are, unfortunately. So you have to kind of work around that. Um, you, you can see, actually, if you go back there, I'll show you, because this is something worth pointing out. So pick the one there that says the THX Cinema Baffle Wall. Yep. Yeah. That is a very classic design. That is yeah. not a good design for a home theater. That is a good design Yikes. for a commercial cinema. And here's why. The LFE channels that they've placed there, that's the classic place that Dolby and DTS like you to place the LFE channel subwoofers. But it is not a good place for subwoofers in most home theaters. Yeah. The better location to put them is actually where the left and the right, well, actually further out on the other side of the left and right speakers in the corners, because then you get the additional room gain uh, yeah. from that. And it's easier if you then do two more in the back corners to get nice, smooth, even bass everywhere. That location mm -hmm. right there is a particularly troublesome location, uh, especially if you're doing four subs. If you're doing waveforming, on the other hand, that's still not the right location, but it's closer. What you could do is actually move those up to the midpoint, roughly the same location where the tweeters are uh, with yep. just those two subs. And that would be a good waveforming spot. If you do four, um, it's not quite right. How would that, uh, without waveforming, raising it up, would that, uh, how would that affect? Dressing? No, that would not be a good idea. So then you're going to get those, that same kind of SBIR problem. You're going to have mm. issues. So it needs to be either on the floor or at the ceiling. Doesn't matter. Yeah. So if you can't put it on the floor, you can put it up towards the ceiling, but it's got to be near a boundary. So it needs to be up against two boundaries then, basically. The floor uh, and the front wall or the ceiling and the front wall. Got you. Yeah, it just can't win. It's either one or the other, it seems. Yes.
Again, unless it's waveforming where you're focusing the base waves. Yeah. Is there a, and you have that now, right? You're doing that right now? I do have that, yes. Like on a daily basis? Yeah. They don't, they don't take it away. It just works once you set it up. <laughs> and um, so construction of the false wall or baffle wall, what is the uh, what kind of depth would you recommend? What's like the common depth? Uh, so I see people go really crazy with this. They do like 36 inches, things like that, like a, or a full meter or whatever. They, it's like, if you've got massive subwoofers, you need to do that. So the depth of it should equal your deepest speakers. Cause the idea behind these false walls is to hide the speakers. And so that's how I do it. But I usually try to find low profile speakers and try to keep the depth of it as minimal as possible. So right. I was just working actually on a demo room project where the subwoofers are going to be only like 13 inches deep. And that's actually the deepest thing we have. So the, the false wall is probably going to be no more than 15 inches deep. You do need a little bit of space between the speaker face and the screen. Ideally, when I say a little bit, like six inches. So that starts to increase depth. But yeah. even I'm not doing that. I think I have three inches on mine. So um, what I typically do is just try to take whatever I have for speakers that are going back there and minimize the depth of this false wall based on the depth of the speakers plus how much distance I need. The, of course, the screen sits on the wall. So some of the, you usually get at least an inch from that alone. So you don't necessarily need to add that extra inch in. So for you, I think, I don't remember what you're doing for subwoofers, I guess. That's, I bet you that's your determining factor. Yeah, I got the, uh, the RBH 1212s, which they're RBH not really, 1212s. yeah, they're not too deep though. A couple of feet, maybe like I three, two, the maybe two ones? feet, two and a half. Yeah, the ported ones. Goodness. Yeah, those are pretty deep. Maybe we can turn them sideways for you. You mean like pointing upwards? No, pointing like All towards right, the age. outer walls. Like sideways as in, instead of pointing towards you, they point towards the side wall. Oh, got you. What Just is that? Uh... Well, here we go. Let me bring this up share the screen here otherwise probably. you're going to need like a two foot deep uh false wall which you can do it's not the end of the world i mean i had planned for three because i thought that would would be kind of a good size for like even bigger subs no <laughs> is that too big i mean it just starts to take up so the problem is you start to eat up a lot of room that you have in yeah. the theater and the theater starts to shrink too much um i mean how long is your room again i don't remember the 24 24 so, you know, you're going to have some stuff on the back walls, too, that brings you down to 21. You know, you end up with a room that's maybe, you know, it's a nice long 24 foot room and your actual interior space when all is said and done is probably going to be around 20 feet. So it's up to you. Uh, well, let's, see, let's check the specs really quick here. It is so dual 12, 92 dB. Depth is 18 inches. Not, not too huge. Is that right? 18. Yeah. 35 up, 16 height. 18. Yeah, it's not drastically big. How far would you want the uh, the wall to be in front of the subwoofer? Is that going to interact with it? Not really other than, okay, so here's where you do start to run into issues. When the subwoofers are placed outside of the screen area, there's not a lot of issue with the subwoofer affecting the screen outside of the fact that subwoofers shake the room, which means it's going to shake the screen. When the subwoofer is sitting right behind the screen, like you have with waveforming, if there is too much, I'm sorry, not enough distance between those woofers and that screen, the movement of the woofers can actually start to notably uh, move the screen. Yeah. So you kind of need, like I said, ideally like six inches anyway. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, that. I guess that starts to push us back to the idea that your three-foot false wall might be a good idea because then that gives us a whole foot between the front of this thing. Like yeah. I said, the other option is don't face the woofer towards the screen, face it sideways. In these environments, that doesn't, as long as it's not creating any kind of weird resonances, that's not going to affect anything. You don't think um, having them point outwards or inwards would create some kind of weird cancellation? It no. shouldn't, and you can test it to see. And that's one of the things we could always do. Do you have the subwoofers right now? Yeah. Yeah, so even like in your empty room, you could just take the subwoofers, wheel them in there, put them at the front before you build anything, hook them up to the amp, you know, take your UMIC one or whatever you have to measure with, um, and run a sweep. 
turn the subwoofer sideways, run another sweep. I'm so going to guess you're going to get a pretty similar result. The thing that's going to change is the SBI effect since the driver is now closer to the wall. Right, right, right. I mean, I do this um, kind of stuff all the time. My subwoofers right now are currently pointed towards each other. Really? Yeah. Wouldn't this sound better outwards, though? Wouldn't the base waves kind of go hit the wall I would, and bounce around? I would, no, base is omnidirectional with these types of subwoofers. They don't have any of this ability to have any directionality to them. Um, okay, so um, so since the speakers are only like six inches deep and I'm building a three-foot wall, would I have to extend the speakers out to be a couple inches from the screen? No, you don't want them a couple inches from the screen. So you want them to have as much reasonable distance to the screen as possible. The only thing you got to watch out for is diffraction surfaces, things around the speakers that they could bounce off of and cause issues. So the way to think of it is this. Acoustically transparent screens are pretty good these days, but they're not 100% perfectly transparent. So think of it, even though a woven screen doesn't have like cut holes in it, think of it more like a perf screen. Imagine a woven screen has created these little pores. The wave radiates out of the, the speaker like a sphere, right? And that spherical sound wave as it radiates expands as it gets farther out. <clears throat> the mm -hmm. bigger the distance between the speaker and the screen, the more pores are able to be seen, if you will, by that wave front because it's gotten that much larger. And so you're talking about that much larger of a surface area. And so the screen has that much less of an effect on the sound. So they, they actually did a study where they took screens into an anechoic chamber and they tried them with speakers with different distances. And the, like one of the dominant findings was, I think it was like a full meter between the speaker and the screen had the best effect, had the best response. And like I said, the reason for that is actually pretty obvious when you really think it through. So you're going to push okay. those back actually as much as you can get as much distance between the speakers and the screen as you can. And we're just going to have to watch out for the fact that you've got subwoofers that are two feet deep and other things in there that the sound can bounce off of. Right, right, right. Interesting. And um, what are some uh, best practices for actually building up the screen, building the frame out and all that? How yeah, you, you, don't want, that? you don't want it to rattle. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, when you put these things together and you're building this high performance theater, you've got a lot of shaking force going on there that can cause problems. So on one hand, you don't want this to be so substantial that it's, like I said, creating a big diffraction source for the speaker. And on the other hand, you don't want it to be so flimsy that when the subs start going, the thing's just shaking like crazy and the screen's rattling off of it and everything. So we almost always build them out of two by fours. That's pretty standard. If you're yeah. handy and you want to do something fancier, um, extruded aluminum, uh, like like uh, the T-channel style, like T30, is better yet. It's just expensive, and so that's why I don't typically see people do that. But aluminum like that, you can get these aluminum extrusions that are about the same as a 2 by 4 but way stronger, and it's not yeah. going to rattle. So if you want to be fancy, that's probably the best material you could use. If you really are trying to do what the rest of us almost always do, it's two by four construction. We typically will scissor a couple of two by fours for at least some of the verticals. Um, and then there's some bracing across of, you know, this way. So what you want to do is make sure there's no bracing anywhere near the speakers. I sometimes see people put verticals between the speakers. I would generally suggest against doing that just because what happens is, like I said, you're creating these diffraction zones, if you will. You're creating these places where sound can now radiate hmm. off of the two by fours from the speakers and that messes up sound. So actually that one there that says the Savoy AVS one is a, is a mixture of good and bad. If we click on that one, yeah, to your left, there you go. Yep. So this one doesn't have any verticals in the way of the speaker, which is right. great. They did create a table. And so there's this surface for the sound to radiate off of below the speaker. That's bad. So the best situation would be something kind of like this, but without the big table. You oh, want to keep it kind of yeah. open if possible. Got you. So the so other one, actually, a better example for that is the audio science review. How is this for a baffle wall thing? Yep. See how that has like sort of a framing in front of the speakers and the screen can kind of go on that, but there's nothing anywhere near the speakers other than those two verticals. And that's actually because that's a screen frame. Those verticals right. are the screen frame supports. Yeah, I got you. Um, yeah. That is a good design because it's got minimal diffraction sources. That's an actual baffle wall. It's not an open one, but it doesn't change what I'm trying to say here. Um, you you want to have as little stuff right in front of the speakers or around them as you can. So this is a no-no, this guy. 
I mean, it's got a yeah, that's got stuff that like unfortunately is going to cause a lot of diffraction. It's just not ideal. This one yeah. too has a lot of stuff that could cause diffraction. All that extra bracing is actually not needed. This is not, remember, this wall doesn't support any weight. Right. So it doesn't need to be strong. It just needs to be able to hold a screen up and some, you know, fabric covers basically. So would you do like a uh, just a regular square frame or rectangular screen, whatever frame, and then maybe do some corner corner brackets to give it a little bit more stability? I don't, so I actually usually, you don't, I mean, you could. You What I usually do is run another uh, horizontal on the top there. Yeah. It comes down where the screen, because that, that's where the screen itself is going to sit on. I yeah. usually try to create a framing for the screen to sit on, um, on the top and bottom. The side, you could if you wanted to, but you don't need to. Um, so if you do the top and the bottom, then you have a place for the screen to mount and a place for the screen's bottom to rest up against, or we even sometimes use magnets or hooks to hold the bottom of the screen in place. Right. So that gives you something to mount to. And then the only other thing besides that you really need to do is make sure you've got a place that you can secure all the trim panels because the trim panels are going to hide that. Otherwise you're going to see it. Yeah. So that kind of comes back to what are you doing? Are you doing stretch fabric? If you're doing stretch fabric, the track has to sit against something hard. So you're gonna have to make some verticals for that, which I don't love, but if you have to do it, you have to, and you can make them small. Um, if you are not doing stretch fabric, you're doing like MDF panels, for instance, you're just cutting a big opening in and wrapping in fabric and Velcroing it, which I think we've talked about possibly doing with your room. Yeah. In a scenario like that, they can secure on the top and the bottom. They don't need to secure anywhere else and it would be fine. So you could basically have your side verticals that are up against the wall, your uh, bottom plate and top plate. And then, like I said, I usually add uh, two more horizontals, one on the bottom, one on the top that frame the screen area. And, um, and then you can just mount everything to that. Um, if you're doing, trying to think what else you could do, I guess you could staple fabric to, oh, that would look really ugly. I don't want you to do that. I don't know. I think what we just covered is probably your main ways you would go about doing this. Um, the other thing is when you do have things that are in the way of the speakers in some way that could be a diffraction source, even if they're above or below it, you can always put some acoustic foam on that. Um, I've done that before. It sometimes helps. Sometimes you get some weird wiggles and you're like, I don't know what's causing that. And then you wrap a surface in some acoustic material and it goes away. Right, right, it, right. It's amazing what all those little uh, surfaces in the way the speakers actually do. Yeah, so I see this guy made some frames here. Yeah. Some covers. What is your best way to attach that, you would say? Magnets or no? Or, or really strong magnets? Really strong. So I'll just tell you, the cheapest, simplest way to do it is going to be industrial Velcro. Mm. And you're going to have to make sure the industrial Velcro is well adhered to each side because I've had it pull off the panels before. But, it, you know, I usually staple them. And that, it's simple, it's easy, it doesn't rattle. Magnets are like what everybody goes to. And we've done that on a bunch of projects. And it was a huge pain in the butt to get them to work. They rattle. Um, right. if they're not strong enough, they fall apart. And then we had one project where the guy went and bought these neodymium, super strong magnets. I don't even think they were for cabinets. It was for something else. And it had like a hole through it though, for a screw. Yeah. When everything came together, we couldn't pull the panels off. And so <laughs> yeah. we ended up using a crowbar and we broke the panel. So the magnets wow. were so strong that like the wood frame itself couldn't handle the pull force. Um, so I would just say, I think magnets are a cool concept. I don't know that they're actually the best solution. Yeah, I've been trying to think about a good way for that because I'd want to be able to get review speakers in and out back there and have enough room. And I was also thinking, maybe could you make a false wall that's kind of slightable, like movable? You can move it in and out. I mean, you can do whatever you want. So the biggest issue I think you're going to find when you start to make things too complicated is you're adding sources of failure and you're adding sources of rattles. So um, I'm going to I'm going to pick on our friend here for a minute just because this is a, a, a neat issue to talk about. Yeah. So uh, Michael Stevens, youth man, um, has this <laughs> yeah. really cool feature on his where you can lift up the screen and they did yeah. that using parts from a car, basically. So the bottom yeah. of it secures with the latch that you have on a trunk and the mounting system that lifts it up and down is using struts like you'd have on a hood or a trunk. Yeah, the hydraulic it's a very thing. cool concept. Yeah. I've seen this done a few times and here's the problem. At his house and at some of the others that I've seen, they rattle. And it's because there's all these extra mechanisms that weren't really designed to handle the force of all these subwoofers. And so it's not like you can go in and like damp it. You can't add some grease somewhere or some damping compound and get it to go away. It's always there because those parts have to stay free to be able to move and allow the screen to go up and down. Um, and at the same time, you run into this issue. So like when I was over at his house checking out a system, I kept looking at it like, what can we do for you to try to reduce this? But 
I mean, it's part of it is when you add hinges and you add struts and you add, you know, the latching systems and everything, you're also adding a bunch of metal parts that are going to rattle. So my recommendation is not to overdo these things with cool features because you do run in the risk of degrading sound basically substantially just for right, some right. feature you're probably going to never use. Yeah, I was just thinking just maybe doing like a little French cleat, just slide the uh, screen on and off. Well, French cleat is the standard way screens attach. Yeah. So oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you can do like magnets on the bottom just to keep the screen from floating around. Got you. Yeah. All right. So Some of them even come with that. That seems like the that seems like the winner. Um, all right. You, you might well, need to anybody... get your wife or somebody to help you take the screen down. The bigger screens usually are a two person job. Yeah. Oh, let's talk about the screen material really quick. Uh, quick though, because I think obviously you can be closer to a weave screen, but there's definitely going to have to be some substantial amount of space if you have like a perf screen. Am I correct on that? Yeah. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of perf screens, to be honest with you. Um, having used all the different screen materials over the years, my experience has been that whatever advantage you might get in terms of brightness and yeah. color from the perf screens, you end up losing in the fact that you get that Moyar effect, you know, the like all those little dots cause this sort of a weird bending of the light, if you will, where lines look like they're kind of flexing around the dots. Yeah. And it also causes, um, in my opinion, you can see those holes if you're too close. Yeah. And even the micro purse. And we're often wanting to get the biggest possible screen for a given room and a given seating distance. And we're also talking now about 4K plus. I mean, the JVCs have 8K. It's 4K for the panel, but they're still doing pixel shifting. That's a legitimate way of adding extra pixels. Um, so you you run the risk, I think, with those systems of, of those micro perfs actually degrading the video quite a bit. Gene did it. He hated it and ended oh, yeah? up switching it out with a woven one. Yeah. I've been doing woven now for like at least 10 years, and it's just been my proven, uh, pr preferred approach. Uh, the ones that I like are very spandexy like. It's not actually spandex, but it kind of looks and feels like thick spandex. Yeah. Um, uh, Chris Seymour at Seymour Screen Excellence and Seymour AV is a friend. I've used his screens now on like all my projects lately. My own screen is from him. I love his Neo material. I think it's the best on the market that I've used. It's what I recommend to people. Um, but anything of that type, I think is good. Yeah, that's what I've been. I've been using the uh, Stuart Harmony screens. It's a. Uh, it looks like it's like you said. It looks like spandex. I remember yeah. making a spandex screen like before I was on YouTube, and uh, it looks very similar to it. I suspect that the actual core material probably is a related weave and and everything. I he could be not correct. Uh, Chris tells me that the gain of white spandex, like we all have been had been. Cause I did that once too. He insisted that the gain on that is like 0.5. Really? Yeah. And the gain on his material, I think, is 0.9 or 0.92 or something like that. And a lot of the competitors, it's like 0.85 or so. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think that. the steward is like 0.7, I think it is. 0.7. 7, yeah. All yeah. right. So I don't know. I, I actually had asked Jason Dustel if he thought he could measure some of these materials because I've got a whole bunch of samples from all the major manufacturers that I did acoustic mm -hmm. testing on. And I was curious if we, I mean, some of them are big. I actually have two that are an entire screen's worth of fabric. And I was curious if he'd be able to, to test gain. And he said it's a lot harder, easier said than done, a lot harder to actually do that. Uh, it right, have okay. to be valid and accurate. So he wasn't keen on trying that, but we may, maybe we'll do something where we'll just post a bunch of the samples on top of a reference white and take pictures and see if it's just obvious that, Hey, this is supposed to be 1.0 game. What do the rest look like? Right. Well, you know, I think uh, a good video for next week would be seating distance to your screen for one row or two rows. We're going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So we'll keep that, uh, on the schedule for next week, but we are coming well, up. Wait, at... hold on. I'm going to be gone yeah. next week. I'll be in Costa oh, okay. Rica, uh, getting eaten by monkeys. But oh, okay. okay. Yeah, we, oh, I've actually got Trino is coming on talking about speaker placement next week. So, so yeah, oh, next, yeah. so in two weeks then. But we, here so, is a, is a, is a teaser for it. I'll just say the screen angles that we now recommend are dramatically different than they used to be. And most people are still citing the old angles. Look at that little teaser from Matt Pose. But uh, guys, I know Matt's got some few Q&A videos on his channel, which is uh, Pose Acoustics. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, Pose Acoustics. 
So uh, links down in the video description. Matt, thanks for stopping by again this week for another uh, episode of Turn My Spare Room Into a Home Theater. No problem. So guys, thanks for watching. Any comments, leave them down in the comment section. And if you have any topics that you want to talk about in a future episode, drop them down in the comment section as well. Thanks for watching.